Morning everyone, hope that you've had a great week. Welcome to this morning's time of, of worship and wherever you may be in the world, uh, we just want to welcome you to our time here at Tableview Baptist Church. Um, we thank the Lord that the church is so much more than a building. Um, that we can gather together in this medium and we may still be the church, um, sitting under the word and, and praying that the word would lead us um, and that God, through his word, would be glorified and he would be honored and our hearts and our lives would be changed as his spirit would work through us. And then we just thank the Lord um, for the church and what this means for us. We eagerly look forward to the day that um, we can gather back together for physical service and, and look forward to that time. Once again, I just want to welcome you wherever you may be and however you may be viewing this and um, it's good to be together. We're going to go into a time of, of worship and song in a moment. And the song that we're going to start our, our time with this morning is a, is a really well-known song written by Matt Redman many, many years ago. Um, and it is called The Heart of Worship. So the question that I've just been thinking about and just would have put before us this morning is what is the heart of worship? Quite rightly, the, the, the author of the song would say, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's more than a song. And that is so true. Worship is so much more than just us singing by ourselves, singing corporately. Worship is our heart surrendered to the Lord. The heart of worship is not singing, but a surrendered heart before God in gratitude for all that He has done. I think Romans 12 verse 1 and 2 summarize this really well in view of the, the great theology that has been taught in chapters 1 to 11 of Romans. Romans 12 now calls the, the church in Rome to, to a time of worship. And he says this, let's read it together. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what, the, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so with a heart full of gratitude for all that the Lord has done for us, let us come and, and sing our songs of worship to Him. Just to bring something that's a worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song is it's not what you.
about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've been But it's all about you It's all about you Father God, we thank you and you are the king above all kings. Lord, you are the king of endless worth. There is no one that is before you. There is no one that will come after you. I pray, Lord God, that you would fill our hearts, Lord, to you. Understand how holy you are this morning. How majestic is your name. The reality that, that the scriptures say that at the name of Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. Father, that we would know that in our heads, but that our hearts would come to understand the reality and the power and the significance of that Lord. And that our lives would follow suit and that we would bow our lives before you, Lord, that you would be the Lord of our lives come back, Lord, to the heart of worship, which is more than a song, but it is a surrendered heart and a surrendered life before you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for Thing I've made when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, perfect key, a great high priest. Who
grateful for the Lord's mercy and grace. And this last week as a church, we celebrated 40 years of the Lord's grace um, over us as a church. And just before we would go into a time of the children's focus and in prayer as a church, um, we're just going to watch a very short little clip, um, just a brief history of where the church began, how it began, and then just a few um, photos from the last decade or so. So praise the Lord for His glory um, being shown through the local church, and we pray that um, the gospel may go forth from these from these doors and through us for for many more years to come until He would call us home. God bless everyone. This is your block. This represents you. Thank you. Okay. Please have the purple. It's about the green. Where would you say your block? Which category would your block go, Melise? In blue. Why would you say that? Because it's the closest colour to purple. Okay. Um, Isabella, where would you put your block? Mm. Why would you say red? I don't know. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Now, this orange block represents God. Which category, which colour would you say we should put God's block? Yeah. Yellow. Why do you say yellow? Because like yellow is bright, it like stands out. Okay. Uh, before we put God in any colour category, let's read from Romans 12, verse 1, 2, 3, and then you can tell me afterwards where I should put it. Okay. Romans 12, verse 1, 2, 3. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay. Is God perfect? Yes. Okay. Um, is he different? Yes. yes. Okay. Now where would you say he would go? This block would go. No. No. no, because he's perfect and holy, he's set apart. Let's use this illustration. We are humans, we sin every day, we're not perfect, um, but God is perfect. So this will represent us and this represents God. Thank you. 
Okay, let's see if it will mix. Let me help it, stir it. Do you think it will mix? No. Okay, let's see. Looks like it's mixing. No. What do you say? No. no. Okay, what's happening? God is above. Okay, it's separating. Because, do you think sin and holiness can mix? No. No. Because God is holy, God is perfect. Um, it's always set, He's always set apart. Sin and holiness can never mix. Um, so what do you think you would like to be? Would you like to be holiness or would you like to be sin? Holiness. Why? Because you want to be different. Yes. You want to stand out. You want to be set apart. Not so. Okay. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for this beautiful day. Thank you for the gift of life. Father, we thank you that um, we have a choice either to conform to this world and follow sin and follow our friends and follow everybody else or to follow you. Please help us to be an example to those around us, our family and our friends and help us to be different. Help us to dwell more in your word and to um, learn more about you. Thank you Father for your mercies, your goodness and grace. We should pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I hope you guys will choose to be different and not um, follow your friends or um, just because you think it's cool because sometimes it's not cool what they're doing. Um, let's all be a little bit different and um, yes, hopefully we'll see each other soon and till next time, bye. Good morning everyone. I'm going to read from Psalm 2 and it's from the Christian Standard Bible. I just felt this was very relevant to the time that we're living in. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. So now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the sun, or he will be angry and you will perish in your rebellion, for his anger may ignite at any moment. All who take refuge in him are happy. Peter quoted from the psalm at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. I've just taken a few excerpts from Acts 2 verse 21 to 36. Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He was resurrected because it was not possible for him to be held by death. He was exalted and sits at the right hand of God the Father until he makes Christ's enemies his footstool. God has made that same Jesus who was crucified, both Lord and Christ. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we belong to you and that we can call you our Father. We are also thankful for the fact that you sent your Son to pay the price for our sin and that as we put our trust in him, we know that we will be part of your kingdom when he comes to reign on this earth. 
as we look around us and we see how the nations are raging and trying to cast off the Son of God, trying to make other plans for themselves. We are just so thankful that you've given us this word, which shows us that you are in control of all things. We know that at the end, Christ will triumph and will return to set up his kingdom on this earth and rule forever over us. And we know that all your enemies will be destroyed. And Father, that is such a comfort to us in times like these, as we see the nations revolting against you, and we see the people rebelling against you and trying to cast off your bonds. We can rejoice in the fact that we know that you ultimately are in control and that there is nothing too hard for you and that all things are going according to your sovereign plan. And so we thank you that we can look up to the hills and put our trust in you. Father, we thank you for your wonderful provision for us during this time. We thank you for your protection over us. We thank you for the fact that we can come to you when we need help and that you will never turn us away. We thank you that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so at this time, we want to lift up our nation to you and especially the leaders of our nation. We want to pray for them, Father, that you would turn their hearts and that many of them would call upon you. We pray for the people of our land and we pray that the Christians would be under your protection. We pray for those who do not yet know you, Father, that you would soften their hearts and pour out your Holy Spirit and that they would be convicted and come to repentance and turn to you. We pray not only for our land, but we pray for all the nations of this earth. And we thank you that you are extending the time to give people the opportunity to call upon you. Father, we just pray that in these last days, your Holy Spirit would be poured out in a great measure upon all nations, and that many souls will turn to you in repentance and be saved. We commit ourselves to you now and we pray, Father, that you would anoint your word as it is preached to us this morning and that it would touch our hearts and change our lives, that you would help us to go forth and share your gospel with all men. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much to Angelique and to Claire for, for leading us up until this point. We just have one or two quick announcements that I'd want to just bring before us as a church body here at Tableview. And firstly, just a word of thanks. Uh, thanks to every single person who has contributed to, to the giving of the church over the last few months. Um, we know that it has been sacrificial giving, um, but specifically, just want to thank all of those who have given over and above their, their, their monthly tithe and offering um, towards the building fund. We knew going into this that there would be a, a deficit and we didn't want to take out a loan um, to meet the needs and the Lord has really provided um, for our needs and so we are right near the finish line and we do have um, an estimated 65,000 Rand um, that is still needed to, to take us past that um, to, to, to completion and so I just want to put that before you and just also say thanks so much to those who have given. Um, every single cent is, is looked after and accounted for and is used wisely to, to make it stretch um, as far as possible so that this would be a great base for ministry here in Tableview. Secondly, we just want to um, say thanks to all of those who have contributed this last week to restocking Elijah's Pantry. Um, that is a great resource that is used, especially over the last months, uh, to help families in need in the community and in our, in our church body. And um, as Jill said in the mail this last week, it is so good to see the, the empty shelves filled um, within a matter of days. And um, already this week, um, a few shopping bags have gone out to meet the needs of, of our church family. Secondly, um, as an announcement, uh, we just want to remind everyone in light of last week's sermon that we heard on prayer, just a reminder that we are called to be a people of prayer and that prayer matters to us. And this is a matter of prayer and um, that every Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, we would want to set time aside for prayer. Today is the first Sunday of the month. And so we would just encourage you to set some time aside for prayer today, lifting up our country, lifting up um, brothers and sisters, lifting up ourselves to the Lord in the midst of this time. And then also remind you of Monday evenings um, as a family or by yourselves to set some time aside for prayer. 
And speaking of that, uh, we would ask for prayer. This coming Thursday, uh, we as a leadership are going to be meeting and there are a number of issues that uh, we would just need wisdom in. Um, but among those are, is the decision um, regarding the shutdown and um, when would be the wisest time for us in the community that we are in, in the place that the Lord has placed us, for us to open again for physical service. And so pray that the Lord would give us much wisdom um, in this and other matters and that, that we would know the Lord's leading in this time. That leads us to, to the time sitting under the word, the sermon this morning. And I'm really excited as we would go into this new series. And it is simply entitled, Be Holy as I Am Holy. And this is rooted in 1 Peter 1 verse 16, where, where Peter calls the church referencing the, the, the statements that made throughout scripture to be holy as God is holy. And so I just want to put forward to us a question that may seem obvious now at this point, seeing as I've already introduced the, the series, but why has the Lord saved us? What is the reason that the Lord has saved us? Immediately off the bat, some of you may say, well, the Lord saves us and the Lord has saved us because God is Love, 1 John tells us that, and John 3 verse 16 would say this, perhaps the most well-known verse in all of the scriptures. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so that is an absolutely truth and an absolute true statement that is being made there, that the Lord has saved us because he loves us. Or someone else say, would say, well, the Lord has saved us for the praise of his name. And that's absolutely true too. For Ephesians 1 verse 5 and 6 would say this. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Here verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. And those are absolutely true statements. And there are many other reasons why the Lord has saved us. But perhaps one of them that we may often overlook as a reason why the Lord has saved us is the call to be holy. That the Lord has called us and he has saved us to be holy. 2 Peter verse 1 verse 9 says this. We need to read verse 8 for context's sake. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. What a glorious text. And we'll come back to that in a, little, in a little while. Or perhaps, as we've just read, 1 Peter 1 verse 16, or we mentioned 1 Peter 1 verse 16, but let's read it together. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so the call over God's people has been to holiness. And so I would want to put before you the question this morning. How is that going in your life? How is the desire for holiness landing in regards to the desires of your heart? Where is holiness in terms of your priorities in living? As Christians, we are saved to be holy. Now, in order for us to understand and to go into the series of looking at be holy as I am holy, we need to understand a few things. First and foremost, and we'll remind ourselves of this throughout the series, is what does holy mean? Angelique did a good job for us just explaining and expanding on what does that word holy mean? And so what does it mean? It means perfect, absolutely perfect perfect. But more than that, it means to be set apart. It means to be set apart. Direct translation is other. 
It, it, it's the sense of completely different to anything else. God is holy. There is none that can be compared to him. And so when God would call us to be holy, he is calling us to live differently to the world. He is calling us to live to a different standard to which sinful humanity lives. And so as we would go into the series over the next few weeks, here's what we're going to do. For today, we are going to look at the problem statement. We are going to ask ourselves the question, what is the issue that lives within my heart that is hindering me from pursuing holiness? Next week and for the weeks following that, we are going to spend looking at who is God and what does it mean when the Bible would call him holy, holy, holy. Why is God holy and why does that matter? And then in the weeks to follow after that, we will be unpacking if God is holy and we do not meet that standard of holiness, we are falling short in meeting that standard of holiness. How can we grow in holiness? And so that's where we are going in the series. I'm excited about it and I pray that the Lord would mold us, not through just today, but he would mold us, challenge us. He would give us a greater love and awe for who he is. And then he would just walk with us over those last few weeks and encourage us as we would grow in holiness, in light of his awesomeness. So today, all I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be asking two questions. The first question is this. Are we not already holy through Jesus Christ? And the second question is going to be, what are the things that are holding us back? What are the things that are hindering us from growing in holiness? And so let's unpack that first question. Are we not already holy in Christ? The answer to that is an resounding yes. We are holy in Jesus Christ. When God would look at us, he doesn't see our sin anymore, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. This is what we've spoken about in the past, is the imputed righteousness of Christ. The scandal of the cross is this, that God doesn't only take our sin away from us, but he then clothes us in his righteousness. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin anymore, but he sees us robed in the righteousness of Christ. And so when you are saved, you are holy. But that doesn't now mean that we sit back on the couch of Christianity and go, okay, well, Lord, I'm waiting out my time. You see, I would bring you back to 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. And especially I would read to you from the NRV, just this first phrasing. God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. I love the simplicity and I love the, the straightforward nature that the NRV would put that, how it would phrase that. He has called us to a holy life. Christian, you are holy in Jesus Christ, but you are also called to live out a holy life. You see, theologians would call this justification and sanctification. Positionally, we are justified. We are rooted in Christ. But the fruit of us being rooted in Christ is sanctification. Kevin DeYoung words it like this, the root and the fruit. And so the root of our faith is justification through Jesus Christ. But the fruit of our faith is a holy living. So what are the things that hinder our growth in holiness? I've got a list of things that we are going to go through this morning. And the first on that list is wrong fear. Now, I know that that may be a strange place to start, but when we would start to look at the holiness of God, it should lead us to a place of reverential fear for who God is. Let me say this to you, brother and sister, this morning. Isaiah, who was a lot more righteous than you and I, he caught up saw the vision of the, of, of the throne room of God 
And he's standing there and he sees the Lord in all of his splendor. He sees the seraphim flying around, shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And we'll talk about that next week as we unpack that. He cowers in the corner and cries out, woe is me. John in the Revelation, he sees the Lord in all of his splendor. And he doesn't stand there, beat his chest and go, well, this is great. He was a lot more righteous than you and me. And he cowers before the splendor and the reverential awe of God. You see, when you see God in all of his holiness, the correct posture to take is one of reverential fear. And so one of the primary reasons why we don't grow in personal holiness is because we have the wrong fears. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 would say this, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Do you get that, what he says there? He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all these things that are defiling us. That are bringing a separation between my heart and the heart of God. He's talking to Christians here, but he's saying this, and then we will bring holiness to completion. But what? What's the last part in that verse? In the fear of God. Now, the fear of God is a strange thing. When we're talking about fear of God, we are not talking about God as as being this angry headmaster that wants to punish you. That is not the kind of fear that we are to have of God as his adopted children and his family. But the fear that we ought to have of him is, number one, primarily of his holiness, of his otherness. That he is perfect and we are not. He is beyond our wildest thoughts. His ways are above our ways. And we are to stand in reverential awe of His holiness, of His perfection. And that ought to drive us to a place of a healthy fear for Him. That we would not bring our Father God's name into disrepute. That as we are called to be holy, as he is holy, we are his image bearers on this earth. And so we know his standard. And so we desire to carry that standard to the world. And so the problem that we have is not that we don't fear enough. The problem that we have as Christians is that we fear the wrong things. Let me illustrate it to you like this. It's an illustration that I remember a few years ago from my, from my, from my, from my one daughter, Eden. She was just about, just on a year old at the time, just learning to walk and kind of exploring her world. And she was in the bath with her sister, Hannah, and um, we had been given these little um, capsules, these bath toys. And you throw them in and the, 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 the tablet, the capsule dissolves and out pops these, these little um, foam animals like there's some that are in the shape of pigs and and sheep and we dropped a couple of these things in the kids are playing with them in the bath and all of a sudden we hear this blood curdling scream coming from the bath and so I run through into the bath and I see Eden like climbing up the back of the bath like trying to get out of this bath as quickly as possible and so I look into the bath expecting to see some like disgusting animal or something that has made its way into the bath. And instead what I see is I see a little foam spider. It's eight little legs are just kind of like waving around in the water. It's no bigger than about that. And it's just kind of sitting there. But as Eden's looking at this thing and just the movement that it had in its water, it freaks her out. And so she is screaming and trembling as we take her out the bath and we hold her and it's okay, look, it's just a little foam. But she had wanted nothing to do with that foam spider, as harmless as that was. 
Fast forward a month or two, and we were down at um, in the Eastern Cape visiting some family, and she's running around playing with um, with Hannah at the time, and she comes inside and she's got something in her hand, and she comes to me and she opens up her hand, and what does she have in her hand? But she has a dead, albeit dead, but it was a dead, massive spider curled up in this ball in her hand. I don't know how it died. I don't know where she got it. And I'm now freaking. I'm like, whoa, let's get that thing out of here. And she's just like, oh, look at this fun thing that I found. And then I remembered these two crazy situations. She was scared over a foam spider that could do nothing to her. And then she is absolutely comfortable holding some massive spider with a massive venom sack on it in her hand. Why do I tell that story? You and I go through our lives with the wrong fears on a day to day basis. And it is my firm conviction that wrong fears lead to wrong living. And right fear leads to right living. What do I mean when I say that? Let me apply this to our day-to-day -day living. You and I would go through life and you may have the fear that you may not have enough money to see you through at the end of the month. That may be the fear that you have. And so this is constantly on your heart. And so you would go into work and you would see that no one is at the catch register. You would see something lying on the table and you know that there's no security cameras in that room. And you'd be tempted to take it, put it in your pocket and walk out. Why would you act in that way? Why do people steal in the, under those circumstances? Because the fear of not having enough to provide for their families would drive them, would motivate them towards that sin. Well, that's the, the reasoning that they would use. Let me use another illustration. You would be a single person, fearful that you would not have a relationship in your life. And you know the statements of Scripture. Do not be unequally yoked. Do not go into a relationship, a romantic relationship, with someone who is not a born-again Christian, who is not pushing you towards holiness in your faith. But out of fear of being alone for the rest of your life, what do you do? You may be tempted to go into a relationship with someone who is not born again. And they would lead you away from the paths of righteousness. You see, wrong fear leads to wrong living. But right fear leads to right living. You see, when we would see God in all of his holiness, it would lead us to say, woe is me. And that is the place, the poverty of spirit, that Matthew 5 verse 3 calls us to have. And that is the place, that is the heart that the Lord uses. When we would be in reverence of Him, when we would be in awe of Him. And as we will see next week, just how the Lord uses His holiness to draw Isaiah to ministry. But let's move on. Number two, the fear of man. Now, I know you may be thinking to yourself, well, isn't that just what we've spoken about in the first point? But it is very different. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says this, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. I love that he says that, that the fear of man lays a snare. You see, what a snare was, was it was this trap that would close around the limb of the animal and it would hold them in place. It wouldn't kill them itself, but it would hold them in place so that they would come and then the, the hunter could take its life. And that is exactly what fear does to us as people. It ensnares us and stops us from moving forward in our faith. 
You see, in the same way as we've just spoken about, wrong fear will, will potentially lead you into sin, where right fear, right reverential awe of God will lead you into holiness. When you are scared of man, it will keep you from pursuing holiness. Why? How? Because by the very definition of holiness, it means to be set apart and to be different. And you will never desire to be seen as different to the world. You will never desire to be seen as set apart from the world when you are living in fear of the world and in fear of what people will say to you, what people will say about you, what people think about you, and potentially what people will do to you. You see, we forget what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. In the last of the Beatitudes, when he says, Blessed are you when, per when you are persecuted on my account. They did this to the prophets and they will do this to me too. We are called as Christians to be different in this world. We are called to not care about what people's opinions of us are. But we are called to care about what the opinion of God is about us. See, I think for many of us, and this is a sad truth, we still have, to a large part, the same mind that we had when we were teenagers. We've just learned how to control it a little bit better. I mean, do you remember when you were a teenager and you had to have the exact right color pair of shoes? You had to have the exact right clothing just so that you could fit in i remember saying to my mom i was like no i need that pair of shoes in that color because everyone has them and my mom was like so what if everyone's got them but for me at that time i had to have that because i needed to fit in now for some of us we don't really care about what clothes we would wear but we seek the approval of man through other things and it can ensnare us. But you are not called, Christian, to be approved by man. You are called to be approved by God. And so when you would have the fear of God, I mean of man, over the fear of the Lord, it can hinder you in your pursuit of holiness and being seen as different. Number three, we see holiness as a gateway to legalism. What do I mean when I say that? That is a wrong statement. Let me say that up front. But some people can wrongly believe that. Why? Because there are, virtue, there are verses in Scripture that say this, that all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before the Lord. And so someone with theology maybe not all in place may say well if all of my righteousness is like a filthy rag before the lord well then i'm not going to pursue righteousness i'm just going to live in the state of grace and i don't want to pursue after all that holiness because you look at who were the guys who were pursuing holiness in the scriptures they were the pharisees they were the sadducees and they were the ones that were always in conflict with jesus and so what does pursuing holiness get to you it gets you into legalism. And so I'm just going to stay away from the pursuit of holiness. And that is a twisted way of thinking. And what it leads to is it leads to something called antinomian Christianity. Anti meaning against, nomian meaning law. Anti-law Christianity. And so what do, what do you do? You do exactly what Romans 6 verse 1 and 2 would warn against. Romans 6 verse 1 and 2 says this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Christian, when you pursue holiness, you are not doing it out of legalism. You are not doing it to earn the love of God. You are doing it because you love God. You see, legalism at its core is this. 
loving the law without loving the one who has given us the law. I'll say that again. Legalism is loving the law without loving the one who has given us the law. And so remember what we spoke about earlier on. Your pursuit of holiness is not to earn the love of the Father. No, we have been adopted into the Father by His lavish love, as Phil spoke about last week. We have been adopted into His family. That is the root. We are held securely in the hand of God. We are rooted in Him. And our holiness is the fruit of that root. And so your pursuit of holiness is not legalistic. Your pursuit of holiness is the fruit of a Christian life in love with God, in right relationship with Christ. Number four, sin is fun and I'm lazy and or scared. We know that sin is wrong. We know more often than not when we are entering into sin. But why do we do it? Well, one, because it gives us that thrill. It would give us that fleshly release that some would call fun. But I would say more than that, why do some mature Christians who, who know that it is wrong, who don't even enjoy necessarily the sin, why do they still commit the sin? It's because unfortunately for many people, they've used sin as an escape. They've used sin as a place of comfort in the midst of this fallen, broken world. And so sin becomes the go-to, sin becomes the comforter in the midst of trial and suffering. And so we build safety in our hidden sin. We find comfort in our hidden sin and so we escape there. And this is a danger because throughout the scriptures we are called to find comfort in God. We are called to trust in the midst of, into, we're tr- called to trust in God in the midst of suffering. Cast your burdens onto Him because He cares for you. But unfortunately, for many, the release, the crutch of going through this world is not Christ. And please, I'm not trying to shoot the guilt gun here or make anyone feel guilty, but I'm just wanting to call out what sin is. And so people find their crutch in sin. And so after a hard day, it's easier to open a bottle than it is to sit before the Lord. It's easier to turn to drugs than it is to turn to the Lord. It's easier to turn to pornography in the midst of loneliness or hardship than it is to turn to the Lord and to the comfort of the fellowship of the saints. It's easier to run away to a fantasy of lust in your mind than it is to run to the Lord. And so sin is fun. And some of us are lazy and or scared. Lazy to kill sin because we don't see the effects that it has on us. But sin wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And we are scared because to kill sin is hard. It feels like death because you are ripping away that place of comfort that you've run to for so long. But I want to take you to Romans, I mean to John chapter 12, verse 24 to 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever loses and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
Now, I know that the context of that would be speaking to to salvation and to those who were seeking after Christ. But the application of that still speaks to our sin. Christian, I say this to you in love today as your pastor. Do not love sin more than you love the Lord. Do not love the things of this world more than you love Jesus Christ. Killing sin is hard, but it needs to be done. And so I'm not trying to load guilt on you today, but I want to remind you of this glorious truth. God's grace is greater than your sin. God's grace is greater than the shame that that sin has borne upon you. And so run away from that. Kill it. It is hard and it feels like death at that moment. But kill it before it kills you. Number five. The fifth reason why holiness is hindered in our lives is that the gospel has been watered down in our modern day evangelical Christianity. Unfortunately, much of the focus of church has been on salvation at the expense of sanctification. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I am absolutely all for salvation. Praise the Lord when someone would be saved. And I pray that many would be saved through the ministry here of Table View Baptist as we would just preach the word week after week after week. Praise the Lord for salvation. But when salvation is the goal and discipleship is neglected just for the sake of how many baptisms we can have and how many people have come and surrendered their life to Christ, said the prayer, I would ask, where is the follow-up? Where is the discipleship? Where is the fruit of holiness in those believers' lives? It is great to repent of your sin. But are you growing in righteousness following after that? And unfortunately, many churches today, and I'm not shooting bullets at our brothers and sisters, please, at all. Many churches today would water down the gospel as come and receive forgiveness. And leave out the part of come, receive forgiveness. And now go out and grow in holiness. And so as the gospel is somewhat watered down, John 14 verse 15 is neglected. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus is the friend of sinners. Yes and amen. But he speaks very differently to the crowds than he does to his disciples. He speaks very differently to the crowds than he does to his disciples. And so I would ask you this question this morning. Are you just among the crowd that are following after Jesus for what I can get from him? Or are we the disciple that is in a relationship with Jesus? And that relationship is based in repentance, which is a swear word in so many churches today. Based on repentance and obedience to Christ. 
the Great Commission. Matthew 28. Let's read it together. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now get verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the ends of the earth. And so I would pray that there would be many, many, many millions, billions of converts to Jesus Christ. But not at the expense of obedience to Jesus Christ. And so we've looked at these five hindrances and there are are definitely more. But these are five common hindrances between us and holiness. Number one, wrong fears. Number two, fear of man. Number three, seeing holiness as a gateway to legalism. Number four, sin is fun and I'm lazy and or scared. Number five, the watered down gospel. Now why do we start here today with this? Why do we start on such a somber note? It's because my my desire for us is not to go into a series on holiness thinking that we have already met the pinnacle of holiness and that God is our servant, but that we would go into the series and as we would see over the next at least two weeks, the holiness of God unpacked through Scripture, we would know who we are. We would see who God is. And from there we would go, okay, God, help me to cross that divide. And then we would open our Bibles and see how the Scriptures would apply to our lives. But I don't want to leave you here just kind of hanging, waiting for weeks to come. I want to call you today to inspect your heart. How is the desire for holiness right now in your life? Do we desire holiness? If not, why not? If we are, praise the Lord, how can we fuel that more? How can you be used to encourage others to fuel their desire for holiness? I would pray for us as a church. I would pray for myself as your pastor. That we would be a holy people, a royal nation. Glad, bold image bearers of Christ to this dying, fallen hopeless world and we would be the ones that would bring them the hope of Christ and we would show them not with arrogance what the standard of God is what holy living looks like but with joy in our hearts and the gospel in our mouths come and find freedom away from your sin in Jesus Christ Oh, that we would find that, we we would walk in that, and then we would celebrate that. Let us pray together. Father God, you are holy. And I pray for our time over these next weeks, as we would look at at that verse, Be holy as I am holy. Lord, you are the standard of holiness. Let us not look around to friends, to family, to other people around us in the world, to look to them to see what the standard of holiness is, but let us look to you. I pray, Lord God, that as we would have studied your words this morning, grow within us a desire for holiness. Show us within ourselves this morning what is killing our desire for holiness. And draw us closer to you, Father God. Let us mourn over our sin. 
bring into our lives brothers and sisters who would lovingly call us out on sin, who would lovingly encourage us to walk in the gospel. Show us the shallowness of sin. Show us, Lord God, the emptiness and the death that sin would lead to. Create within us a pure heart as we desire holiness and we pursue holiness as we pursue you. Let the fruit of that righteous living be sweet and joyful and let many be drawn to Christ through it. We pray this in your name and for your glory in the church. Amen.